This is DVP reporting on Sunday, September 25th, 1983. My 37th game scored of this season will be presented on this cassette. It'll be the Reds against the San Diego Padres to close out a three-game series at Riverfront Stadium this afternoon, and this will also close out season's play between these two Western Division teams. This will be game three of a seven-game homestand for Russ Nixon's Reds, the final homestand of the year for Cincinnati. Following the Padres into town will be Tommy Lasorda's apparently playoff-bound Los Angeles Dodgers for a two-game series starting tomorrow night. And it looks like right now, as we head into the final week of this 1983 baseball season, that the Dodgers are going to go on and win the National League Western Division title. They have a fairly comfortable lead right now over the second-place Atlanta Braves. So the Dodgers in for their final two games against the Reds Monday and Tuesday, and then the Giants come in to close out the home schedule for Cincinnati, a two-game series next Wednesday and Thursday, and then the Reds go to Houston for three games to close out this 83 season, a season which has seemingly flown by, and one week from today, in a scheduled night game at the Astrodome, the Reds and the Astros will close out regular season's play. That will be game 162 of this 83 campaign. But right now, it's the Reds against the Padres, final game in the rubber match of a series uh, coming up this afternoon. I've got six games to recap at the front part of this cassette, three Reds wins and three losses. Now, my last game scored, number 36, was a week ago yesterday, on Saturday night, September the 17th, and that was Johnny Bench Night at Riverfront Stadium. A record-setting crowd of 53,790 came out to see Johnny Bench whack a home run in the third inning. It really didn't help. The Reds lost the ball game eventually to Mike Madden and the Astros, 4-3. to three. But nevertheless, that crowd will never forget that big home run by Johnny Bench on his night at the stadium. Quite an eventful evening at Riverfront. And then the Reds and the Astros closed out that series on Sunday afternoon, September the 18th, and Houston took the final two, a 4-1 to Astros win on the 18th of the month behind Mike Scott and Frank DePino. The totals in that one, the Astros had four runs with seven hits, no errors, they left 11. The Reds had a run, six hits, committed one error, and stranded seven men on base. Righty Mike Scott gets the win as he goes seven and one-third innings, a five-hit, one-run baseball to go to nine and five on the year. His first win this season was back in June at Riverfront, a complete game shutout, his second Major League shutout, and or it might have been his first Major League shutout, his first win of this season, his first win as an Astro, and now he's piled up eight wins since then. He's turned this into a pretty good year. The former New York Met, Mike Scott, he goes to nine and five. He allowed just one run in seven and a third, three walks, eight strikeouts, and a balk in that game. And then lefty Frank DePino came on for one and two-thirds. He allowed a hit, nothing else. He got his 18th save of the year. Mario Soto took the loss for Cincinnati. He was going after his 17th win. It looks like right now, well, definitely, I can say that definitely, Soto will not be a 20-game winner. And, uh, well, a couple of months ago, we were looking uh, towards Soto maybe winning 20 this year and becoming the first Reds 20-game winner since Jim Merritt won exactly 20 Back 13 years ago, Tom Seaver, of course, was a 21-game winner in 1977. However, 14 of those wins came with the Reds and 7 with the Mets before the midseason transaction brought him to Cincinnati. Uh, but uh, Soto now with 16 wins, the most since Seaver in 1979. If he, can, if he can win his 17th game, I believe it'll be the most since 1974 when Billingham and Gullett each won 17. But he could not do it on September 18th. He's now 16-13. and 13. And, well, also after that ball game, uh, well, a few days later, Soto went out again, and I have not been on the air with a broadcast since that time, so Soto has gone out twice, and he had a no decision his next time out. So I'll say that uh, right now. He's still 16-13 and 13 with a start or possibly two starts left, so he could win 17, maybe 18 games this year if he could win out his remaining starts here in 83. He didn't do all that bad of a job, except he had some... Erratic control in that game last Sunday. He allowed seven walks, six hits, with seven strikeouts, four runs all earned in seven innings. Then Billy Shearer came on, two innings a hit, and a strikeout. Soto 16-13 and 13 with that loss. A crowd of 14,109 saw that game at Riverfront in two hours and 45 minutes. No, run, no home runs for Cincinnati. A home run for Houston's Allen Ashby is eighth of the year, at least his second against the Reds at Riverfront. And Terry Poole had a home run his seventh of the season. Game-winning RBI on the home run by Allen Ashby. His fifth game-winning RBI of the year. Danny Dreesen knocked in the only Reds run. That came in the bottom of the third inning. The Astros never trailed in the game for Dreesen, his 52nd RBI of the season. So not a good afternoon at the ballpark. Reds losing 4-1 to one, uh, behind... 
the pitching to Mike Scott. Astros go on and win that series as they leave Riverfront for the final time this season. Then there was an off day on Monday, September the 19th. Then the Reds went to Atlanta for a mini three-game road trip. Just the one series, and then they came right back to Riverfront to start up this series against the Padres this past Friday evening. On Tuesday, September the 20th, the Reds and the Braves were supposed to play the first of that three-game series. However, the weather had something to do with it, and they could not play the ball game. After one and one-half innings, the game was rained out with the score. Reds won, and the Braves nothing. Phil Necro on the mound for Atlanta. He had allowed one unearned run in the first inning. Gary Reedus had scored on a wild throw to third base made by first baseman Chris Chambliss on a ground ball hit by Dave Concepcion to third. And Reedus came around to score the unearned run, but it was all washed away. And they played two the next night. So that's only the second rain out this season, the first on the road. And, well, in looking back, uh, in looking back, I believe that would be the first road rain out for the Reds, would you believe, since May 18th of 1980, when the Reds and the Expos got washed out in the first of three at uh, Montreal's Olympic Stadium. And then there were three rainouts in 1981, all at Riverfront, none last year, and one rainout this year before that September 20th washout at Atlanta, and that was April 23rd at home against Montreal. They made that up with a July 25th doubleheader. And now the Reds play their sixth uh, doubleheader of the season. There are now no wins, two losses, and four splits in that department, including a split against the Braves on Wednesday night, September the 21st, a 5.40 p.m. doubleheader. The first game was all Atlanta. A 9-1 final score, right-handed rookie Craig McMurtry gets his first win in a while. His 14th of the year is second against the Reds, at least his second against Cincinnati, as he goes to 14-9 and on the season in pitching a complete game five-hitter. One run earned he gave up, five walks, four strikeouts. And for Cincinnati, righty Charlie Puleo, who will start today's game, was the losing pitcher. Boy, he had a rough outing. He gave up six hits. Five runs, four earned in two-plus innings, walked one, and he did not strike out a batter. Rich Gale went one inning, allowed two hits and a run with a walk. Ted Power, three innings, three hits, three runs, all earned, two walks and a strikeout. And then Ben Hayes, two innings, a walk and a strikeout. So the Reds pitchers, uh, not really a great job in that ball game. Atlanta had a five-run bottom of the third inning. And never trailed after that. The Reds tied it up 1-1 with a run in the top of the second inning and an RBI base hit by Tom Foley, his eighth rookie of the year. But Claudel Washington produced the winning run with his fourth game-winning run batted in of the season. The Braves had three homers in that game. Chris Chambliss hit a pair, his 19th and his 20th. That ties his major league high in homers set last year, 20. Dale Murphy had another one, his 35th of the year. A candidate, a solid candidate for his second straight MVP award. The totals in game one of the doubleheader Wednesday. Atlanta 9, 11, and 1. They left 5. The Reds had 1, 5, 1 air, left 8 men on base. Paleo 5, 11, the loser. McMurtry 14, and 9, the winner. A 2-hour, 19-minute first game. Let's flip the page and go to the second game now with the September 21st twin bill. The Braves lose it, and they blew a 3 to nothing lead. The Reds came all the way back to win that ball game by the score of 4-3. to three. I should say it was a 2 to nothing Atlanta lead, then 2-1, to one, and then 3-1 to one Atlanta. And the Reds came back and scored twice in the eighth, and the winning run in the top half of the ninth inning, knocked in by Ronnie Oster, his fifth game-winning RBI of the season. He knocked in two of the four Reds' runs. The other two were driven in by Danny Bellardello with a key two-run game-tying single to center in the eighth inning to give him his 30, uh, 30th and 31st RBIs of the year. He's having a pretty decent season for a guy who had never played above double-A before this season, and now he's pushed into an everyday uh, status as the Reds' a regular catcher here in 83, and I think he's done an admirable job. A big hit, and that's a critical loss for Atlanta, and each loss is critical for the Braves uh, late in this season. And the Reds, I think, can pat themselves on the back. They almost, you can almost say single-handedly, knocked Atlanta out of this race, at least in the last two series, because the Reds win two of three on that mini road trip to Atlanta. They win the next day in a single contest, a 6-4 final, and the Reds swept them, remember, last week at Riverfront Stadium. And there was a big grand slam in that series by Nick Asaski for a game-winning RBI. So over the last five games played versus Atlanta, the Reds went 4-1 and one and finished up with a record of six wins, 12 losses versus the Braves. At one time, that was 2-11 and 11 in favor of Atlanta. And so the Reds uh, did win four of the last five against the Braves and uh, split the doubleheader. Uh, nice come from behind, 4-3 to three win. Four runs, eight hits, no errors, 12 men left on for the Reds. The Braves had three runs, nine hits, a pair of errors, and stranded eight. Reliever Tom Hume gets the win. He's three and five. Two innings of two-hit no-run ball. He walked a batter, struck out a batter. 
Billy Shear was in there for one inning, walked the batter. And Frank Pastore, the starter, he did a pretty good job, six innings. He allowed seven hits, three runs, all earned. He walked two and struck out three. Phil Negro got the start for Atlanta. Now, those were the starting pitchers in the rained-out game that they played an inning and a half of on September the 20th. That was, uh, that was wiped off. Uh, they waited about an hour and 30 minutes, I guess, before they called it, and there were several storm fronts coming into the Atlanta area. There was no way they were going to play it. And it was Pastore against Negro, and uh, both managers decided to wait and pitch them in game two of the doubleheader instead of the first game. Necro went six-plus innings, allowed just five hits and a run with five walks, five strikeouts, and a wild toss. Not bad. A no decision. Terry Forster came on for one and a third, allowed two hits, two runs, a walk, and two Ks. And Steve Bedrosian, their ace reliever, takes the loss. He's given up some big hits over the last uh, few weeks. And just when they needed him the most, he gave up that grand slam to Osaski, remember? A week ago Wednesday, and now he's 9-9 nine and nine on the season. One and two-thirds innings, a hit, a run, two walks, two strikeouts. They had a crowd of 12,621 paid and total uh, for that uh, uh, double header. And the very next day, I think, against the Dodgers, or a couple of days later, the, Re uh, the Braves went over the 2 million mark in home paid attendance. They were at 1.9 million after that 12,600 plus on September 21st. Game two took two hours and 56 minutes to play. Two, five, six. Let's see, any home runs in that game? Uh, no, no homers in that game. Gary Reedus had a stolen base. He was one out of two in steals in that game. He was one for four in steal tries in that doubleheader. Thrown out three times in one day. 37 out of 50 in steal tries through games of September 21. So Ronnie Oster, a big base hit in the ninth inning, and the Reds split the doubleheader with a 4-3 victory. Then the next day, single contest on Thursday, September the 22nd, a night game. Reds win it 6-4. Now there's a 3-0 lead blown. That's the game I was thinking of. Atlanta blew a 3-1 lead in Game 2 on Wednesday. They blew a 3-0 lead on Thursday. The Reds came all the way back. They tied it up with 3 in the 4th. They got 2 in the 6th. They got one insurance run in the 8th inning. Win it by two runs for rookie right-hander Jeff Russell, who goes over 500 to 4-3. and three. He gave up four runs, only two of them earned on seven hits in six innings. He walked a couple and struck out one. Bill Shear then went one and a third, a lot of hit, a walk, a strikeout. Tommy Hume came on for his ninth save. So he was 1-0 with a save in that series. He tied Shear for tops and saves. One and two-thirds innings, one walk, nothing else. Ken Daly, the losing pitcher for the Braves, he goes to 4-7. and seven. He allowed five hits, five runs, three walks, five strikeouts, and 5.1 innings. Tommy Boggs came on for two-thirds, only his third or fourth appearance this season. He's been injured. He's been bothered by the rotator cup problems. Donnie Moore went one and a third, and then Terry Forster mopped up for one and two-thirds. The Reds had six runs, eight hits, two errors, and left four. The Braves had four runs, eight hits, one error, and left eight. Russell, the winner, 4-3. Daily, the loser, 4-7. Two hours, 41 minutes. 13,466 for the Reds' final game in Atlanta this year. They win the final two against the Braves for the last five. And that is a pleasant stat. Dan Drayson had a home run for Cincinnati. He gets the game-winning RBI as well. His eighth game winner of the year is 12th home run of the season. There was also a brave home run from Glenn Hubbard, a solo blast leading off an inning, his 10th of the year. That's a new career high for him, eclipsing his previous high of nine set, set in 1980 and tied in 82. So a good stay at Atlanta, and that road trip was over. Two wins, one loss, and then there, and then the Reds uh, caught up playing that night, came back home to Riverfront Stadium, opened up this series. On Friday night, September the 23rd, the Padres shelled us 11-8. The Reds made that a more respectable score by coming up with two ninth-inning runs, and there was a two-run home run with one out in that ninth inning by Gary Reedus, his 17th of the year, and the 17 home runs equals the high-water mark by any Red in 1982. Last year, Dan Dreesen led the team with that figure of 17. Reedus having a very good rookie season overall, gets his 49th RBI as he scores himself on that two-run home run. Cedeno, Trevino, Oster... Reedus had RBIs. Oster had a pair, giving him 55 on the year. Dreesen had a couple the day before that, giving him 54. Householder chipped in with three RBIs in that September 22nd ball game. He's doing a good job over the second half of the season. We get eight runs on 11 hits. We outhit him by two, but we lose the game. The runs and the hits uh, look to be enough, but uh, San Diego came up with three more runs. The Reds' pitching uh, was not uh, spectacular, to say the least, in that ball game. You get eight runs, and we had the ace on the mound and Mario Soto. You would think that would spell a Cincinnati victory, but not so on this particular evening on September 23rd. Mark Thurmond started for San Diego, a no decision. He goes five and two-thirds, allowed six runs, three of them earned on seven hits with a walk and two strikeouts. Luis DeLeon, the winner. 
He is 6-6, six and six, two and two-thirds innings for him. He allowed two runs, three hits. Sid Manji came on for two-thirds of an inning, almost eligible for a save, but not quite. Soto, six innings, five hits, six runs, but only three of them earned. He allowed a big home run to Tony Gwynn, a three-run home run, all unearned runs, I think, in the third inning, or maybe it was the sixth inning. There were four three-run innings in that game, two for each team, and the Padres had a four-run seventh to ice the contest. For Gwynn, his first home run of the year is second in the bigs. Roop Jones had a home run, his 12th of the season. What a series he's had to this point. He was two for five in that game and knocked in five runs. He had a game-winning RBI his eighth of the year. Allen Wiggins has stolen base his 60th of the season. Kelly Paris a steal for the Reds, his fifth of the year. So there were three home runs in the game, Gwynn, Jones, and Reedus in the ninth for Cincinnati. 11 runs, 9 hits, a couple of errors, 6 left on for San Diego. The Reds had 8 runs, 11 hits, 3 errors, and stranded 5. So a sloppy game, a field. Or a lot of unearned runs in that game. There were 6 unearned runs, 6 runs, 3 of them earned, given up by Thurman, 6 of them, 3 of them earned, given up by Soto. His ERA doesn't jump that much, it goes up just a few points to uh, 2.69 now. On Soto's earned run average, Ben Hayes, the loser, he's 4-5. and five. He only faced two batters, walked them both, and they both scored. Ted Power, three innings, four hits, three runs. He walked two and struck out two. So Hayes didn't get anybody out. He suffers his fifth loss and nine decisions. They had only 6,635 on hand at Riverfront on Friday night. That's the weakest crowd of the year, by the way. A two-hour, 49-minute contest. And then yesterday afternoon... In what has become a rarity, a Saturday day game. That's only the second Saturday day game in the second half of this season. The other one was August the 27th at home against the Cardinals. That is Riverfront Stadium Saturday day games. Or, well, in fact, even on the road, the Reds always play at night on Saturday. Or they have, anyway. Uh, over the last several months, there's hardly been any Saturday day contests. But this was a day when yesterday, a beautiful day for baseball. The Reds come out on top with two men out in the bottom half of the ninth inning. The man who's been doing it over the last few weeks off the bench, the retiring Reds veteran Johnny Bench, came up with a pinch-hit single, a line drive down the left field side to get Paul Householder home from second base with a game-winning run. Bench continues to perform amazingly in the clutch. He has been getting dramatic hit after dramatic hit over these last few months, and he is going out with a flourish. Next Sunday will be his final day as a Major League ball player, of course. He's not going to start anymore the rest of the year, but boy, he can produce off the bench. His eighth pinch hit of the year, his second game winner off the bench, his ninth RBI as a pinch hitter, his 52nd RBI overall, his seventh game winning RBI overall. Those are the numbers attributed to Bench after his game winning single yesterday. The Reds pull it out 3 2 after trailing 2 0. Another come from behind win. Each team scored a pair in the first inning. And there were not any home runs in that ball game. Reds had RBIs from Oster, and then Skeeter Barnes with an infield single got the tying run in in the first inning, his second major league ribby, and then Bench with the game winner with two out in the ninth, which came off Floyd Chiffer to make a loser out of Sid Manji. He goes to 8-3 and three on the year. Ed Whitson, the starter, allowed two runs, five hits, and eight innings. He struck out five and walked two. And Bruce Bereni went all the way for the Reds to get his ninth win against 14 losses. He has now matched his number of wins from last year. He was 9-18 and 18 last season. His fourth complete game of the year, he allowed six hits, two runs, with four walks and seven strikeouts. The Reds had three runs, six hits, one error, and stranded six. The Pods had two runs, six hits, without an error, and they stranded nine. Exactly two hours to play that game, and they had 9,615 at the stadium to see the Johnny Bench game winner in the bottom half of the ninth inning. Another big hit by J.B. Boy, he has been something else. Well, really, since announcing his retirement, uh, I guess he wants to go out in a flourish, and just about every time he steps to the plate, it seems like it's a critical situation. Uh, the, remember the last time, uh, last Saturday on Johnny Bench night, he tied it up with a two-run home run in the third inning. Eventually, we lose the game, but to no fault of Bench, uh, because he came up with another hit later in the game also. He also walked in that game, and as a pinch hitter, has come through on eight occasions now, and has driven in nine runs on those eight pinch hits. So that's a look at these last six contests. Uh, Taking a look at the line score, the winning and losing pitchers, etc. The Reds winning three of these last six. The Reds will be looking for their fourth win in the last five games today and their second straight over the Padres. The Reds' 27th one-run win of the season yesterday afternoon against only 19 one-run losses, a very good record in that department. And overall, the Reds are 71-83 and on the season. 
12 games below 500. And trying to even out things at 9-9 nine nine this afternoon against the Padres. Let's hope that can happen. Charlie Puleo against Andy Hawkins, a couple of young right-handers, on the mound at games beginning for the respective teams this afternoon. So it's the Reds against the Padres from Riverfront coming up on September 25th. So stick around for Reds baseball. Top half of the ninth inning at Riverfront, three-run lead. Cincinnati takes into this San Diego ninth, and it's Salazar settling in to face Billy Shear. Here's a swing and a high fly, right center field. Milner, householder. It'll be Milner, and the center fielder gets it put out. One pitch, one out. And it'll be the rookie second baseman, Ed Rodriguez. Pitch, and that's ball four. So Rodriguez gets a base on balls. That's the first allowed by Billy Shearer. He'll face now Lansford. And a ground ball slap to the right side. It's Oster going on to Foley and a fourth throw. All hands are safe. A throwing error charged against Ron Oster. And I guess Ron simply would be considered guilty of trying too hard to maybe get a good throw and a quick throw to second and possibly see a game ending double play. As a result, the Reds get nothing. On the throwing error, Rodriguez is safe at second base, and now Bobby Brown represents the tying run. Pause in the pitch. That's a softly hit ground ball to third. Barnes goes to second, and they'll get the force play right there on Joe Lansford. That's a pretty good play by Skeeter Barnes. He was moving off to his left to make the play and got the throw on to Oster in time to force Lansford as Rodriguez goes to third. Brown is on at first. Russ is out of the dugout and has just now reached the Riverfront Stadium mound. So Kurt Bavakwa is going to be the pinch hitter for pitcher Dennis Rasmussen. Sheer and out away from chalking up his 10th save of the season. He and Tommy Hume are tied. I guess Gordy Coleman and the folks are poised and at the ready. Huh? Standing down there behind the plate, getting all geared up for the big giveaway of prizes. Two and two, and pitching again is a rookie left-hander, and a fly ball hit back into right field. That should be it. Householder has it, and this one belongs to the Reds. Here in the ninth inning, San Diego, no runs, no hits, an error for the Reds. Two men left on. Final score, Reds five, and the Padres two. We'll be back in just a moment. Well, it's going to be a big afternoon for a lot of folks here at Riverfront Stadium. They're going to walk away with some hardware today, and it was a big afternoon for Russ Nixon's ball club. They beat San Diego 5-2. to two. They got the scoring underway, the Reds did, in spectacular fashion in the bottom half of the second inning. It was a nothing-nothing ball game after Charlie Puleo had wiggled out of a jam in the top of the inning by getting rookie second baseman Ed Rodriguez to bounce into a force out to leave two men on base. In the bottom of the second, Andy Hawkins retired the first two batters, but then a pair of rookies, Skeeter Barr, and Danny Billardello started him on the road to defeat. San Diego came back with a run in the fourth inning on a double by Gary Templeton, tied it up in the sixth inning on a sacrifice fly by Terry Kennedy. But then in the bottom of the sixth inning, the Reds loaded the bases after two men were out, a Dreesen double, an intentional walk to Householder, an unintentional walk to Barnes, and Billardello shot one just there down the left field line to double in two. That was the tiebreaker, and the Reds were out in front to stay. Cincinnati added its final run in the seventh inning on a double by Eddie Milner 
Milner off a of rookie left-hander Dennis Rasmussen, a steal of third, and one out later, a Ron Oster base hit to right center. Ronnie extended his hitting streak to 11 games and picked up his club-leading 57th RBI of the season. Charlie Puleo ran into some problems in the seventh. He turned things over to Billy Shear, and Billy went the rest of the way. Two and a third innings of two-hit shutout baseball, and of course, picking up his 10th save of the season, while Puleo goes 6 and 11, and Hawkins, a record of 4 and 7. Big play in the game was in the eighth, when uh, Shear gave up a leadoff single to Tony Gwynn, and a base hit to Terry Kennedy. Rupert Jones then topped one along the first baseline. Bill Ardello's throw to first, hit Jones. He was called for interference, running out of the baseline. Gwynn, who had scored, was sent back to third, Kennedy was dispatched back to first, and Gary Templeton promptly hit into an inning-ending 6-4-3 double play, and that was the extent of it. On the afternoon, the Reds had five runs, six hits, one error, and left six. The Padres had two runs, six hits. They stranded nine. It will be the Reds and the Los Angeles Dodgers here at Riverfront Stadium. A 7.35 beginning tomorrow night. And the starting pitchers, Frank Pastore, 8 and 12. Fernando Valenzuela, 14 and 10. Plenty of seats available for the two against L.A. And the two to wrap up the home part of the 83 season against the San Francisco Giants, a series that will start on Wednesday night. We'll have the pregame shows tomorrow evening on most of these same stations beginning at 7.05. Again, the final score today in a game that took two hours and 32 minutes to play before a crowd of 21,483. The Reds five and the Padres two. That was Marty Brenneman reporting from Riverfront Stadium with the good news. The Reds won at 5-2 to two this afternoon and win the rubber match of this series, and this enables the Reds to split the seasonal series against Dick Williams. San Diego Padres, and it also sends the Padres one game under the 500 mark. You might have noticed in the scores and comments program that I just played that I did edit some of the highlights that were played. He had replayed a couple of home runs that the Reds had from rookies Skeeter Byrnes and Dan Bellardello in the second inning, but I decided not to put that on side A of this cassette at this particular time. I'm going to save that till later on when I recap the ball game. I do have those highlights, and I'll be playing them a couple of times on this cassette, and it might have sounded kind of strange, uh... He led up to those replays by saying that Barnes and Bellardello, a couple of rookies, started Hawkins on his way to defeat, and then there was a cut, and he started talking about something else. But uh, the reason it sounded like that is because I edited that particular part of the Scores and Comments program by Marty Brenneman. And so those were home runs in that second inning to explain that a little bit, and I'll be replaying them later on. So Barnes, his first major league home run, his first time up in this ball game. He was starting at third base today. Nick asaski has been having uh, been having problems. He's out with a mild injury, and he hasn't been in there the last few days, riding the crest of a nine-game hitting streak when he gets back in. And Barnes has been doing a pretty good job filling in. He made a good play in the field in that ninth inning that I played on a forced play to get Lansford on a ball hit by Bobby Brown. A pretty good play turned in by the rookie Skeeter Barnes. It was just recalled a couple of weeks ago about three weeks ago, from the Indianapolis AAA team. So he and Bellardello hit the home runs in the second inning to get the Reds scoring underway. The Padres then tied it up with a run in the fourth and a run in the sixth inning. The Reds went ahead to stay with two in the sixth and added an insurance tally in the seventh inning and win it by the eventual three-run spread at 5-2. to two. Six hits apiece today. Six for the Reds and six hits for the Padres. The Reds have collected just 12 hits over the last couple of days, but it managed to win those two ball games, winning 3-2 yesterday on the Johnny Bench game winner in the bottom of the ninth inning. Dan Bellardello, a game-winning RBI this afternoon. Puleo the win. Shear breaks out of a first-place tie with Tom Hume and saves his 10th of the year. He's into double figures now. Andy Hawkins takes his seventh loss. It was a two-hour, 32-minute contest this afternoon, although I clocked the game at a minute less than that at 2.31. Official time is 2.32. And the attendance was almost 21,500 this afternoon at the stadium. That's for Fan Appreciation Day at Riverfront. It's an annual tradition at Riverfront Stadium. The final Sunday at home for the Reds each season is the Fan Appreciation Day game. And a lot of people come out to haul home the prizes that are awarded by the Reds organization. And, and well, they're not chintzy at all when it comes to giving away the prizes on the Fan Appreciation Day game. Now, after... Uh, normally, after the final home game of every year, they give away the prizes, which number in the hundreds and in the thousands of dollars. But this season, it's not the final home game. There's still four games to be played at Riverfront, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, against the Dodgers, Dodgers, Giants, and Giants, respectively. And uh, that is because 
it is because they end the season at home in the middle of the week that they do not have the Fan Appreciation Day game as the final home game this year. It will always be on a Sunday so they can draw more people into the stands and have a wide, a wide variety of uh, uh, people to give the gifts to. I imagine they feel that if they had the Fan Appreciation Day game on Thursday, they might have to keep some of the prizes themselves because there might not be enough people in the stands to give them to. They've only been drawn about 6,600. Uh, uh, well, a couple of times they have. Only 9,600 the other day earlier in this series and 6,600 on Friday, the weakest crowd of the season. That comes on the heels of that 53,000 crowd that they had last Saturday, the all-time regular season record. And just uh, less than a week later, they had the worst crowd of the season. So it goes from good to the bad. And an and in-between crowd today to come home or to come out and collect the gifts after the ball game and also to watch a good contest. 21483 paid in the stadium this afternoon. So we're coming down to the home stretch now of the season, just a week to go, and I've got a couple of games to score after this one here in my 83 campaign. I've logged now 37 contests here in the 83 season. I'll take a look at my records now. With this win, the Reds second in my last three scored. The record is now just one under at 18 wins and 19 losses, just two shy of last year's win total, and just two shy of 200 Reds wins scored lifetime, going back to the last nine years to 1975. So 18 and 19 this year, including a record of 3 and 1 against the Padres, finishing against them 1 and 1 at Cincinnati and 2 and 0 at San Diego. Winning percentage this year is 486. At home, the record is 8 and 9. And so far in the month of September, two wins, three losses, and since the All-Star game, nine and eight. So I move over 500 in that category. The Reds have still lost four of my last six scored, but have won two of three. This is game 347, lifetime scored. It's number 340 with the Reds. 198 wins now, closing in on 200. 142 losses, 56 over for a 582 winning percentage for my career in scoring games. On, on cassette tape, there have been 233 games verbalized. 131 of those are Reds wins, 102 in the loss column. That's 29 above water for a 562 winning percentage. Again this year, one under, 18 and 19, so I'll have to win out the Reds will my remaining games here at 83 in order to finish over 500 and to equal last year's win total. Hopefully that can happen as I plan on scoring uh, uh, one game this upcoming week at Riverfront and the final game of the year, of course. A week from today at Houston, a scheduled night game between the Reds and the Astros down in the Dome to close out the regular season. So that's a look at my personal data. Let's take a look at the umpires now for this one. Okay, behind the plate is the very vocal Dutch runner at first base, Lanny Harris at second base, Ed Montague at third base, Lee Wire. The weather, very good, again at Riverfront Stadium. This series has been blessed with good weather at Riverfront. So far on the homestand, no rain delays at all. And the weather has really uh, taken a turn over the last couple of weeks. We were in the 90s last Sunday and Monday, I believe, but now down into the mid-70s for the highs as autumn has reached the Midwest, finally. The warmest summer in many, many decades, an average high of, I think, about 90 degrees in the Cincinnati area. They hit 100 on at least two occasions, exactly 100, as I heard on WLW on several afternoons during this sizzling summer of 1983. But finally, we're getting some more comfortable conditions. 74 degrees for the high today in Cincinnati under partly cloudy skies. 45 degrees for the low this evening. The game was underway about a minute late. A 2.15 scheduled start time. It was underway at 2.16 p.m. Cincinnati time. Rob Reiner. Rob Ryder, I should say. Rob Ryder singing the national anthem. And he was emceeing some of the ceremonies on the field after the game as they were giving away the prizes. And he was also up in the booth to visit with Marty and Joe for a couple of seconds. And he, of course, is from the local Cincinnati Bob Ron show, or Braun and Company, I believe it's called now. And Rob uh, Ryder, another outstanding job of singing the National Anthem. And with the win today, the Reds have now won two straight games, and also four of the last five. And Cincinnati has won eight of its last 12 games. That's a 6-6-7 percentage. The Reds have lost four of the last eight. The Padres have lost now two straight and four of their last five. So they're on a downhill side of late, going to 1-4 and four in the last five games and losing this series two games to one. And the Reds close out at 9-9 nine and nine against the Pods, going 5-4 and four at Riverfront versus San Diego, four wins, five losses at San Diego. The Reds had six base hits today, and it's interesting to note there was only one single 
And that was the insurance run that we got home off the bat of Ronnie Oster on a blue pit to right field, the only single of the game for Cincinnati. The first five hits, in fact, were all of the extra base variety. No triples, three doubles, and the two home runs I mentioned that I will play when I get to that second inning by Barnes and Bellardello. So five extra base hits, and that that means a total of 15 total bases and 28 at-bats. And I figured the slugging average for today's game alone at 536. That makes the team slugging average go up a point. It's at 357 now. That's seven points ahead of last year's season-ending pace. And we finished at a fairly weak 350, which I think was worst in the National League. Not a whole lot better this year, but at least seven points better. We've hit many, many more home runs with the two today. The Reds have poked 104 long balls this year. That is 22 more than all of last season. A lot of players have gotten in on the act, too, including three pitchers, Russell, Gale, and Pastore, have all had homers, as opposed to one pitcher's homer last year, which was last August hit by Pastore. And in some home run statistics, in case you're interested, the Reds have now swatted home runs in three of their last four games, nine out of the last 13, and the Reds have had at least one home run in 11 of their last 16 games. In other words, they've gone homerless in only five of the last 16 games, and several of those are multiple homer contests as well, including one three-homer ball game, in which we had three in one inning, the only time we've done that this season. The Reds' team batting average stayed the same. It's at 239. We've had 1,219 hits and just over 5,100 at-bats. Reds have had over 1,800 total bases. And the Reds' team earned run average fell a couple of notches to 3.91. And looking at some of the team statistics here before we get underway with the game, the Reds have pitched 1,379 and a third frames and have given up 666 runs, exactly 600 earned runs, 127 homers. So we've been out homered by 23 this year. The Reds have had 32 complete games, and that's the most since 1980. We've had five shutouts and 29 saves now with 412 pitching appearances. Billy Shear getting into his 71st game of the year to this afternoon. That's the most appearances in three years since Tommy Hume made 78 game appearances back in 1980 on his way to his Fireman of the Year award with that 256 earned run average. So far on this homestand, the Reds are 2-1 and one with a 4 earned run average and a 240 batting average. With a 16 run scored, averaging over 5 per game on the homestand. The Reds overall have scored 588 times this season. They've had 361 extra base hits now. And total 138 stolen bases with a 2 out of 3 today. They've been caught 74 times. And Redis and Milner now in a dead tie in stolen base. The stolen base lead 38 steals apiece now and almost the same amount of attempts. Milner has been caught. Two fewer times than Reedus. Reedus has been nailed on 13 occasions, three times by Atlanta in one day last Wednesday during the doubleheader. The Padres have stolen a lot of bases, even more than the Reds. Uh, with four today in four tries, 168 steals, and they've been thrown out just 63 times this year. They've got a two fifty two batting average that is entering yesterday's game. And a 27-29 and record in one-run games. The Reds are 27-19 and in one-run games. So that'll be some five games better than San Diego in that department. The Reds are now 35 and 42 at home against the West, 35 and 48, and so far in September, 11 and 10. The Reds have won no fewer than 11 games at any month this season. Best month being August at 15 and 15. The Reds are now two over since the All Star game, a good 514 percentage at 38 and 36 after going 13 under, 34 and 47 before the break. The Reds are now even in daytime play also at 25. And 25, as opposed to 11 under, 11 games under 500 in nighttime contests. The Reds have now won 50 times on artificial turf this season. That's a look at some of the statistics for the Reds uh, through this ball game of September the 25th. Let's have a look at the lineups now. For San Diego, newcomer Bobby Brown leads off in left field. He was just recently picked up. He was picked up, I believe, in late July after... Steve Garvey went on the disabled list with a dislocated uh, thumb that he suffered at home against Atlanta in the first game of a double header, and that snapped Garvey's consecutive games playing streak at, I believe, 1,207, and Brown came in, and he stepped in and has been doing a fine job. He's had five homers, including one grand slam, and that came August the 6th, and part of a double header off of Tommy Hume and the Reds. And the Padres swept us a pair, a 286 batting average for Bobby Brown, a journeyman outfielder, has spent a lot of time in the Yankees organization, also 
has been in the Blue Jays system, the Seattle Mariners. He started out, I believe, with the Philadelphia Phillies and went over in the Raleigh Eastwick deal to the Yankees in 1978. Also, Jay Johnstone in that trade. 286 for Brown with five homers, 22 knocked in. Hitting second at first base is Alan Wiggins. He used to be an outfielder, but is playing a lot at first now with Garvey's absence. 278 for Wiggins' average. He's got speed to burn. Coming into this game with 60 stolen bases. Gets two more today, three for the series now for him. No homers, 22 RBIs. He's had 20 doubles and has legged out a couple of three-baggers. Hitting third in right field is a young one, Tony Gwynn. And he is a good ball player, a good outfielder, and a solid hitter. A 313 average since his recall. A home run that came against the Reds. In this series, second major league homer, 34 runs batted in. And Gwynn uh, has the longest hitting streak this season in the major leagues. I believe that's a 25-gamer that was stopped on September the 19th. Bobby Brown earlier had the all-time San Diego record of a 21-game hitting streak, which he started against the Reds on August the 5th, and he extended it through most of August. And Tony Gwynn and Bobby Brown now with the two longest hitting streaks in the majors this season. And Brown uh, had uh, eclipsed the all-time San Diego record of, I believe, 16 consecutive games hit safely in by Dave Winfield, now with the Yankees. That was back in 1977. And now Gwynn has passed up Brown by four. So that's interesting. Two doing it in uh, just about the same period. In fact, they, I think they both had a 20-game streak at the same time alive. Hitting fourth is the catcher, Terry Kennedy. A 285 average for this guy. He's a solid ball player. Topping the team and runs batted in 94. He's had 16 home runs. Hitting fifth in center field. A man who's done a good job in this series, hit safely in all the games, had seven RBIs in the set, had a two-run triple yesterday afternoon, knocked in five, including a home run as 12th of the year on Friday night, including a game winner. So a 236 average for him, not much on the average, but he's knocked in 49 with a dozen home runs. Hitting sixth at shortstop is Gary Templeton, 257 for his average, and he still has not panned out with San Diego since that trade that brought him to the Padres and that deal for Ozzie Smith before last season. Of course, he was hampered with injuries last year and just hasn't really got untracked. It doesn't appear. 257 with three homers, 37 RBIs. He's a much better hitter, th hitter than that. Hitting seventh at third base is Luis Salazar, the former Pirates farmhand obtained in August of 1980 and a deal for Kurt Babacle, whom they got back now and made the final out today. 255 for Salazar. He's done a good job with the power. 13 home runs, and he's knocked in 42. Batting eighth is a rookie. Edwin Rodriguez. Now, he's a guy we've never seen before. His first ever appearance against the Reds. He was picked up along with lefty pitcher Dennis Rasmussen, who got into today's game as their final pitcher, in the August 26th deal that sent John the Count Montefusco to the New York Yankees. Rodriguez, an infielder, uh, listed as number 20 on the Yankees roster in the American League Red Book, as I noticed, from Ponce, Puerto Rico, and uh, played this ball game against the Reds, starting at second base, batting eighth. Uh, was on a couple of times in four trips. I don't have any of his uh, his uh, statistics, averages, or, or uh, homer RBI totals. But he hasn't been up long. Just recently recalled from the minor leagues, probably AAA Las Vegas, which is managed by former Reds coach Harry Dunlop. So Rodriguez and Rasmussen, the latter originally in the California Angels organization, obtained the John Montefusco deal late last month. Batting ninth is their pitcher, Andy Hawkins, an 0.37 average, not much with a bat. One hit, 27 at-bats, and no RBIs. And for the Cincinnati Reds, starting it off in center field is Eddie Milner, trying to break an over 20 streak entering this game. He did break up the string, but it was in his final trip. A 2.54 game-time average for Milner. That has really slipped of late. What with that dry spill? Nine home runs, 31 RBIs. Batting second in left field is Gary Rita, starts off the day with an average of 2.47. He's hit safely in four of his last six. Club leading 17 home runs and 49 RBIs. That's fourth on the team. Hitting third at second base is Ronnie Oster. Dave Concepcion's not in his usual three position because he is serving a three-day suspension. And that is because of the incident at Chicago in August where he spit, apparently, on umpire Dave Pallone. There was a hearing September 15th, and it's just now well, come to pass. And uh, Concepcion serving the three-day suspension as ordered by the National League office uh, this series against the Padres. He will be eligible eligible to play tomorrow against Los Angeles. So Oster filling the number three spot at second base today and also yesterday. And a 266 average with a 10-game hitting streak entering this game. Continuing with the lineups now for today's game between the Reds and the Padres, the seasonal series wrap-up between the two teams. The Reds' number three hitter, as I mentioned, Ronnie Oster, 
And Dave Concepcion not in there because he is serving that three-game suspension for that altercation with umpire Dave Pallone when he was ejected from that ball game at uh, Wrigley Field. I believe that was in August. Concepcion hitting 234 at the time that he was suspended. 121 hits for Davey, 517 at bats. And he was up in the booth as, uh, I guess you could say, a color commentator with Marty and Joe over the last couple of days. He said he could not make it up there today for his final day of the suspension uh, because he had a severe headache, and he told Marty Brenneman that, down uh, by the batting cage before the ball game. So Davey was unable to make it up into the booth today, or else I might have had some of the, his comments and his expertise on the cassette this afternoon. And he offered uh, a few bits of information to Marty and Joe over the last few days, and he was reading off some pitching stats, too. Uh, not exactly an eloquent job of doing it, but he got it done as he was reading off some of the Padres reliever statistics as they were brought in in the ball game on Friday. So he was taking over Joe Nuxall's job there a little bit, and uh, Marty was really ribbing him up there. He says, well, anytime you get suspended, come on up. Uh, and uh, I don't know how many more times he's going to be suspended, but he was really hot and uh, apparently spit on Dave Pelo, and I don't know if it was inadvertent or not. I, don't, I can't imagine him deliberately just spitting on an umpire. But, uh, well, nonetheless, he is suspended for three days starting Friday, and now this is the final day of the suspension. Oster, 266. I said that. His home run count is 11. His RBI is 56. He got his 57th RBI of the year today. That is significant because no red has had more since 1981. The 57 RBIs equals last year's high watermark which was set uh, by two different players, Dreesen and Cedeno. They both had 57 to top the 1982 Reds, which went 61 and 101. And we're not going to do much better in the RBI department. We're a whole lot better in the home run department and in some other various categories, but not too... Well, we're not better off at all and uh, in earned run average or batting average. In fact, worse in both of those departments, team-wise. And uh, we're just barely going to get above uh, last year's 57 RBI uh, for the high. But a much better record. We're about 10 to 12, maybe 15 games better than last year at this time. With this being win number 72, that's nine more than we won all of last year, keep in mind. So Oster, 57 RBIs, topping the team by now three. He could conceivably lead the team and runs batted in when he bat batting a lot of time in the eight position, which is silly, but he bats down there against some left-handers. Can you believe they had Oster batting eighth behind Alex Trevino, the other night, I think it was Friday night when Thurman was on the mound. Unbelievable, but Oster was batting eighth behind the 215 batting Alex Trevino. Amazing. Uh, batting fourth at first base is Danny Dreesen, a 279 batter. Now, here's another category where we're not going to top last year. The top hitter last season, 289, Cesar Cedeno and Concepcion, remember, about at 287. Nobody's going to even top that. In fact, we might not have anybody over 280. That 279 I read off for Dreesen is tops on the team. So it's really amazing when you look at some of these stats that the Reds are much better than last year. As I mentioned, the power has really come around. We've got over 100 home runs for the first time in three years and a, a whole lot more than last year. And getting a great year from Soto, of course, who's had 16 wins. That's two more than he had uh, even last season when he had a great year at a 279 earned run average. But his ERA this year, 269, even better. So we're giving a, getting a good year out of him, a fine year out of Danny Dreesen, who batted... Uh, I think about 269 and last year, 279 entering this game with a three-game hitting streak with 54 runs batted in and a dozen home runs. Hitting fifth in right field is Paul Householder. He's having a good September, having it safely in 19 of his last 25 games entering this game, a 255 average for Paul Householder. He's had five home runs. He's had at least one against the Pods. I think he's had two against the Padres this year, and he's knocked in a total of 37 runs, three in one game this week or last week, hitting sixth at third base is Skeeter Barnes, William Skeeter Barnes. A 188 average for him in limited playing time since being elevated from AAA September 1. He hit 337 in Indianapolis in the American Association this year. He's had three major league hits entering this game. His fourth one is his first home run. So his first major league homer comes in just his 17th major league at bat. And you look at Alex Trevino, who didn't get his until his 1,070th at bat or something like that. And Barnes has got some power. He's been down toiling in the minor leagues for a long time, finally gets his first major league call up and produces uh, with a home run today. Hopefully that's signs of things to come from him. He looks pretty good on defense. He can play the outfield. He's been at first base and at third so far for the Reds this year. Coming into the game with no homers and a couple of runs batted in 
Hitting in the seventh position is the catcher, Dan Bellardello. A good day for him. He was the star of the game with Joe Nuxall, entering the game with a 227 batting average with seven home runs in his rookie year and a decent total of 31 RBIs. Batting eight that shortstop is Tom Foley, and Foley has now started uh, all games in this series, while with, as I mentioned, Concepcion sitting around because of the suspension. And Foley's done a pretty good job. In fact, he started both ends of a doubleheader last Wednesday at Atlanta when Concepcion set out those ball games. That was not because he was suspended. They just set him down. And, uh, well, Concepcion, I should say, was at third. Yes, Davey was playing some third base last week at Atlanta. Did a good job over there. I think it might be the first time he's ever started at third base. He played a little bit of third last year, late in the season. So they had Foley at short, uh, Concepcion at third, taking over for the injured Nick Asaski, who was batting 266, tied for second on the team, as I mentioned, with that nine-game hitting streak, and he's hit safely in 18 of his last 21 games. And Foley getting several starts of late and has had a few hits. He's got 18 hits now on the year, hitless today, a 209 game-time average, no home runs, and eight runs batted in. Batting ninth is the pitcher, Charlie Puleo, five hits on the year, a 111 batting average, with three runs batted in, looking for his first Major League home run. So it's Puleo against Hawkins, a couple of right-handers. Hawkins, just a 23-year-old, born in 1960 in late January, out of Waco, Texas. Facing Cincinnati in the bottom of the first, he got them in order. And in the top of the first inning, Puleo turned the same trick. One, two, three. Bobby Brown, a fly ball to left. Wiggins fanned Sweeney. And Gwynn hit a ground ball to second base. Then in the bottom of the first inning, Milner hit a ground ball over the mound, fielded by the second baseman. He threw him out. Reedus, a fly ball to center. And Ostra, a ground ball to the first baseman, Wiggins. In the top half of the second inning, the Padres had a one-out double to right field off the bat of the hot-hitting Rupert Jones, who... Oh, had about five or six hits in this series. This is his only hit today, but he's on two times and hit the ball like a bullet in the sixth inning. An out to left field. A double to right field for Jones, his 12th two-base hit of the year. That came after a Terry Kennedy inning opening fly ball to right field. With a runner at second, Gary Templeton hit a fly ball to right. Householder a busy man in this inning. So two out, one on for Luis Salazar, and Puleo walks Salazar. And then Edwin Rodriguez, up for the first time ever against the Reds, hit into a fielder's choice, a ground ball to shortstop, Foley, Fed on to the second baseman, Oster. They got Salazar to end the inning. No runs, one hit, a walk, no errors, and two runners are left on base. Now in the bottom half of the second inning, the Reds have a big two-out rally. Two swings at the bat put a couple of runs on the board. Dan Dreesen opens it up with a fly ball to center field. Paul Householder on the first pitch, then grounded out to first baseman Wiggins. He took it himself. So that was five straight batters retired by Hawkins, and that string comes to an abrupt halt as Skeeter Barnes and Dan Billardello come up with back-to-back round trippers to give the Reds a 2-0 lead. Let's listen into this action with Marty Brenneman in the bottom half of the second inning. That one hey, driven back into deep get left field. Here, it might up, be Skeeter's up, first. Up, it is. <laughs> Skeeter Barnes gets his first major league home run as he shoots a 2-1 and one pitch out of here to left field. Just now reaching home plate and getting the glad hand from Danny Billardello. So Skeeter has taken Andy Hawkins downtown, and Cincinnati jumps out in front here in the second. one nothing. Billardello has done that seven times in his rookie season as he steps in, hitting 227. He hits one back into deep left field, and that's going to be gone. Skeeter Barnes and now Danny Billardello and the rookie catcher touches them all. Cincinnati leading it two to nothing. So the Reds exhibit a little bit of long ball power here in the second inning with back to back shots to left field and rookies hit them both out of here. Barnes well, that's what it sounded like in the bottom of the second inning. Back-to-back, two-out solo home runs by rookies Skeeter Barnes and Dan Bellardello on consecutive pitches. Barnes hit it out to left field for his first of the year, his first major league home run and team homer, number 103. And then on the very next pitch, the first pitch delivered to Bellardello, he yanked one out of the park to left field. And that's his eighth of the year, his eighth of the majors. He ties Cedeno. And let me see, that would be for about seventh on the team in home runs. 
Reedus with 17, Asaski bench Dries and all with 12, Oster with 11, Milner with 9, Sedanio and Bellardello now with 8, and that'll be tied for 7th on the team in home runs. Bellardello a pretty good job with his power, 8 home runs, and I think 6 of those have come to the home yard at Riverfront Stadium. And so that's a quick way to get the runs on the board, and that shows you how important your home runs can be. And well, although I will say, without these home runs, we still would have won the game. With two in the sixth, one in the seventh inning, it would have been a 3-2 to final, just like yesterday, but it's nice to have the comfortable lead late in the game for your pitcher to work with. With two down and nobody on, Barnes and Bellardello hit consecutive home runs, and I believe that would be the third time this year we've had back-to-back -back home runs. I mentioned that we had three home runs in one inning, I think on the last homestand. That's the first time that had been done, and amongst... The three homers, Milner and Reedus, had back-to-back -back jobs, and Joe Nuxall at the time said that was the second time they had hit consecutive home runs this season, and the first time it had done, I, uh, I scored it back on May 2nd at Philadelphia, and the same two batters, Milner and Reedus, and now I scored again as Barnes and Bellardello hit back-to-back -back blasts. 104 home runs for the team now with the one hit by Bellardello. By the way, the RBI totals, Barnes, his third of the year with that solo blast, and Bill Ardello with that home run, his 32nd RBI of the season, and the Reds lead quickly 2-0. Tom Foley then hits a fly ball to left field. This one does not leave the premises, and they don't have three straight home runs, but it's out there in the garden, and Bobby Brown hauls it down to end the inning. I think the last time the Reds had three consecutive home runs was back on May 27th of 1980, and I scored that game. That was at home against the Dodgers when Griffey, Foster, and Dreesen, I think, hit consecutive home runs. In the fourth inning, I think it was, and that was the first time that had been done since 1956, when I think Ted Klazuski, Gus Bell, and and one other player had uh, consecutive home runs. That was a long time of, uh, since that had happened. Three straight home runs back in 1980, and now we get back-to-backers for the third time this year here today. Two runs, two hits, nobody left on, and we lead it, and now let's go to the top half of the third inning. Paleo walks the pitcher, Andy Hawkins, on a 3-2 pitch. Then on the first pitch to Bobby Brown, he pops one up fair to the first baseman, Dreesen, for the first out of the inning. Wiggins then hits into a force play, 4-6, to six, Oster to Foley. The throw to first from Foley does not get the speedy Wiggins. He's got the good speed to beat it out. And then he steals a base, his 61st, and he is stranded there as Tony Gwynn grounds out first baseman to the pitcher. No runs, no hits, a walk, and one man left on. In the bottom of the third inning, Hawkins gets the Reds 1-2-3 for the second time. He had retired every batter except two through the first uh, three innings, and the two batters he didn't get out hit the ball out on him there in that second inning. Puleo struck out swinging in the third, and Reedus struck out swinging to end the inning. In between was an Eddie Milner ground ball to the pitcher off of a 3-2 pitch, so nothing across there. In the top of the fourth inning, San Diego cuts the deficit in half as it scores its first run of the ball game. With one down, there's a base on balls to Rupert Jones, who's on for the second time of the game, that was after a first pitch pop-up to the second baseman off the bat of Terry Kennedy. Jones at first with a 3-2 pitch uh, that misses for ball four. He then steals a base, his 12th of the season. They were running, as we say, with reckless abandon in this contest. And then he comes in on a double to left field hit over the head of Gary Reedus by Gary Templeton. His 19th double of the year produces his 38th RBI of the season, and it's a 2-1 Reds lead. With one down, a runner at second, Salazar hit a ground ball to shortstop. And then there's a faux pas, I guess you could say, made on the bases as Gary Templeton tries to advance on what appears to be a wild pitch by Charlie Puleo. On a pitch to a, a rookie Edwin Rodriguez, a ball skips in the dirt and bounces in front of the plate. Bellardello pounced on it, and he saw the runner going to third. Templeton was trying to make third, and the throw got him fairly easily. You score that 2-5, to five, and that uh, should not be a caught stealing on Templeton because he had he was trying to advance on the potential wild pitch, and so... You don't penalize him there in his stolen base uh, uh, category. You put him out 2-5, to five, and Barnes gets the put out. That ends the inning, so that's a big out right there. And so I guess we can thank Paleo for throwing the ball in the dirt that time. Otherwise, uh, uh, there would have been a runner in scoring position and the chance of them tying the score in that fourth inning. Uh, Bill Ardello's done a good job at throwing some people out this year, and he guns down Templeton here to win the inning. In the fourth inning, they get one run, one hit, nobody left on. In the bottom of the fourth frame, there's a leadoff walk to Ron Oster on a 3-0 pitch, and then Dreesen hits a ground ball to shortstop, and they get the out at first 6-3 as Templeton throws out Dreesen. Oster goes to second. Householder then draws a base on balls from the, the pitcher Hawkins, 
First and second, and only one out for Skeeter Barnes and Dan Bellardello, the two guys who yanked the ball out of the place in the second inning. They each hit fly balls to the outfield this time, but neither is deep enough to uh, get out of the park or move anybody up. Barnes, a fly ball to left, caught by Brown, no advancement, and then Bellardello, a fly ball to center to end the threat. So Hawkins, uh, first and second jam, he got out of it. No runs, no hits, a couple of walks, no errors, two runners left on. After four innings, the Reds have two runs on the two homers, no errors with two left. After four innings for the pods, a run, a couple of hits, no errors, they've left three. And every hit, yes indeed, every single hit in the game for each team at this point has been of the extra base variety. There were hardly any singles in this game overall. There was a bun single later in the game by Gwynn, and also another later bad hop single by Gwynn, and a single by Kennedy. The Reds had just the one single, as I pointed out, uh, five-sixths of the Reds' hits once for extra bases, either doubles or home runs. That's kind of interesting. Okay, we're going to the fifth frame now. Paleo gets the pods in order, one, two, three, for the second time in the game. Edwin Rodriguez, a first pitch pop-up to the second baseman Oster. Hawkins, a ground ball to second base. And Brown had a fly ball to the left field to Rita, so no runs, no hits, no errors. In the bottom of the fifth inning, the Reds are out one, two, three again. That's the third time that right-hander Hawkins has turned the trick. A called third strike past Foley, a ground ball 6-3 by Paleo. And then a Milner fly ball to center field to stretch his hitless string to 23 straight at bats. After five innings, the game time was only an hour and 15 minutes, and the Reds had a 2-1 to lead after five. In the top of the sixth inning, the Padres tie it up here, and their first two get on base. And this base on balls by Paleo, given to Alan Wiggins, really hurts him, as most of the walks will. Wiggins, a base on balls off of a 3-2 pitch, and then he's off to the races again, his second straight stolen base. He was 0-3 in this game, but stole a couple of bases, scored. His 62nd steal of the year, a new Padres club record. He's at second base with nobody out, and Gwynn has a bunt single, first base side. Paleo was running in between the runner and Dreesen, and Dreesen was trying to tag the runner, but Paleo was in the way. And uh, kind of an unusual uh, situation right here. It really wasn't Charlie's fault. He was doing his job and trying to get to the base, but Dreesen wanted to tag the runner, but couldn't because the man Paleo was right in between him. Right in between, and he could not get the tag down. I don't know if he would have gotten the speedy Gwynn or not, but he was safe. It goes down as a bunt single. Wiggins goes to third. He scores on a sacrifice fly hit to right field by Terry Kennedy to tie this g ball game up at 2-2. Two and two. For Kennedy, it's 95th RBI of the year. Runner at first, one out, one in for Roop Jones. He hits a line drive to the left fielder, and then Gwynn steals a base. The fourth steal of the game already in five and two-thirds innings for the Padres. That's all they get, too. For Gwynn, that's his seventh of the year. He's been thrown out on four occasions. Gary Templeton then ends the inning with a strikeout swinging. That ball got away from the catcher. Bellardello threw down to first to get the out. In the sixth, a run, a hit, no errors, and one man left on. Now on the bottom half of the sixth inning, the Reds again, after the first two men were retired, get a run home. All runs but one for Cincinnati in this game came with the first two batters being retired in the inning, and that's a good sign. In the second inning, the two out home runs, and now with the first two gone, Dan Dreesen comes up with a double to left field. A ball that was uh, just fair inside the line, almost touched by the ball boy. That was on a three and two pitch. Well, we get two doubles in this inning. Now, one of them was almost uh, interfered with by the ball boy down the left field line. I'm not sure if it was Dreesen's or Bill Ardella. We'll hear in a minute, as Marty calls this in the sixth. So a couple of more big extra base hits in the contest. As we get two doubles here in the sixth inning, after Reedus had a Fly ball to right to open the inning off of a 3-2 pitch. Oster grounded out first baseman to the pitcher. And then Dreesen started the inning with a double to left on a full count delivery. And let's see, that is double number 14 for Danny this year. Then they intentionally walk Paul Householder to get to Skeeter Barnes. And he is unintentionally walked on a 3-2 and two pitch to load up the bases for Dan Bellardello. He comes through with a big game winning base hit. A double down the left field line just barely fair. A two-run base hit, Dreesen scores, Householder scores, Barnes is held at third for Bill Ardello, his 15th double of the year. That ties him with Bench, who has not had a double in a few months now. If he'd have run out his game-ending base hit yesterday, it would have been a two-base hit. He didn't run it out, though. The man scored from second, so Bench is not given his 16th double. But Bill Ardello is given his 15th double here in the sixth inning of this ball game. A big clutch two-out hit. He had a big two-out uh, base hit to tie a game up in Atlanta last week. He's done a fine job, I believe, this year. Two for his first three in this game with three RBIs. That gives him his 33rd and his 34th ribbies of the season. And it eventually will garner him his sixth game-winning RBI of the year. That is fourth on the team 
on the game winners list. So second and third now, two down for Tom Foley. He is intentionally passed. The third walk in the inning, second intentional given up by Hawkins. Paleo ends the inning by striking out Sweeney. We get two big runs to take a 4-2 lead on two base hits, three walks, no errors, and three runners left on base. Let's listen to the sixth inning action from Riverfront. That is laced down the left field line, a fair ball. It rockets off the wall, kicks out towards left field, and Danny goes to second base standing up. And boy, I'll tell you, the Reds' ball boy sitting down that line in the visitors' bullpen almost played that ball. He hopped up off that stool he's sitting on and started to reach for it, and fortunately the realization apparently hit that that was a fair ball because he snapped that glove back. So Danny goes the other way with a double to left, and immediately the Padre bullpen will start to get busy. Runners are going to be moving. And the payoff pitch is on the way, and he walked him as he missed high and inside. The bases are loaded. And Bill Ardello will try to get the job done for the second time this afternoon. Danny is homered. He has flied out to center field. Strike one pitch. Smash. Fair ball. Down the left field line. Into the San Diego bullpen. Greason scores, Householder scores, Barnes to third, Bill Arandello to second, by four to two, Cincinnati. Well, Marty, I'll tell you one thing, Lee Meyer came as close to calling that a foul ball as you can because he had actually turned to foul territory and pointing, but there again, the ball and trying to avoid the ball certainly could have been a part of it, but Lee's first indicator was foul. Well, a big two-run double by Danny Billardello. As Dreesen and Householder come across, Barnes goes to third. Danny having a big afternoon. The Reds lead by a couple. The Reds end up with two runs, two hits, and strand three in that sixth inning. And another big base hit by Bill Ardello. Hit the home run in the second. Now a big two-run game-winning double, as it turns out here in the sixth inning. Now let's go to the top half of the seventh frame. Charlie Puleo's last inning. He does not survive all of this inning, in fact. He gives up a one-out ground rule double dunked into right field by rookie Ed Rodriguez after Salazar opened the seventh with a fly ball to left field. Rodriguez hit a looper toward right field. Householder coming like gangbusters, could not catch the ball. It bounced fair and then bounced into the blue box seats. And, of course, that uh, means two bases. Ground rule double for Rodriguez. That could very well be his first major league extra base hit. Or his first hit, I'm not sure. That's at least his first hit against the Reds, of course. So with one on, one out, there's a pinch hitter for pitcher Andy Hawkins. It's a big right-handed batting first baseman, Jody Lansford, or Joe Lansford, if you will, uh, just recently recalled from Las Vegas. He was up uh, a part of last year also, late last season. He was called up in August and played several games in my game scored. He hits a line drive right at the first baseman, Dries, and he picked it off above the carpet. Throw to second was not quite in time to double up Rodriguez. So two down as the pinch hitter Lansford is uh, out on the line drive. Then Bobby Brown draws a base on balls, and that uh, spells the end of Charlie Puleo's afternoon. The fifth walk given up by Puleo, and, well, he will normally walk a high amount of people, and he's done it again this season. He walked, I think, 98 batters, or 90 batters last season. Only walked one in the final three weeks, though. He has walked 88 now this year in uh, less than 138 innings pitched. He has taken out for lefty Billy Shear, who throws one pitch and gets out of this jam as he gets Allen Wiggins on a pop-up to the second baseman Oster out into shallow right center, and the inning was over. No runs, one hit, and two men left on. In the bottom of the seventh inning, they were leading by two. An insurance tally is tacked on for Shear and uh, for the team. There is a leadoff double to left center by Eddie Milner. That stops his 0 for 23 dry spill. That's his first base hit since, uh, I think it would be September 16th when he hit a home run as ninth of the year. And then 23 straight at-bats without a base hit, and I think one or two walks involved in there, and maybe one sacrifice bunt also. And now he comes up with a double to left center, and then he steals third base. That stolen base is 38th of the year in 49 attempts. The double is his 22nd of the year. That's third on the team behind the co-leaders, Householder and Oster, who have 23 doubles apiece. Milner at third, nobody out. Rita strikes on Sweeney. Then Oster comes up with a base hit to right field. That gets the run in. The only single of the day for the Reds. That extends Ronnie's hitting streak to 11 consecutive games. That's a personal high for Ronnie this year. He earlier this season had a 10-game hitting streak. And if he can get a base hit tomorrow, he'll tie Dan Dreesen for the 1983 club lead for hitting streaks. Dreesen had a 12-game hitting streak stopped by the Mets in late July. That is the club high figure to this point. Ronnie now with an 11-gamer. He's gone 7 for his last 14, a 500 average in that period. 
So a base hit for Ronnie, giving him his 57th RBI to tie last year's season's high. And that leads the team this year by three. And that's a big one-out base hit right there. Then Dreesen bangs into a 1-6-3 double play. That ends the seventh inning. This is, by the way, against a new pitcher. It's rookie left-hander Dennis Rasmussen. Lansford stays in the game to play first. Rasmussen on the mound batting second. Lefty Dennis Rasmussen, his first ever appearance against the Reds. And he gives up a run here. A double, a strikeout, a single, and then a 1-6-3 double play hit by Dreesen. No runs, no hits, or make that one run, I'm sorry. Two hits, nobody is left on base. Let's listen into the, let's listen into the run scoring action in the seventh with Joe Nuxel. Rasmussen's pitch swung on and lined into left center field. That is cut off by Jones. Eddie on his way to second to throw that way. Way off target, and Miller in with a double. Rasmussen sets, and there goes Eddie for third. He's going to get it easy. Kennedy's throw is not near in time. And for Milner... That's number 38 for Eddie. A one away with Milner at third base. Oster swings and loops it into right field. That's going to be a base hit, and the Reds lead it 5-2. to two. Moran with his first base hit of the ball game. He picks up his 57th RBI, and it's a 5-2 to two game. That brings us now to the top half of the eighth inning. Billy Shear on for his first full inning of work. He gives up a bat hop single to right field off the bat of Tony Gwynn. And that ball hit the cutout on the sliding pit and bounced over the head of Danny Dreesen. It appeared to be an easy ground ball, but Gwynn gets a, a bat hop single out of it, his second straight hit. He then moves all the way to third on a following single to left center hit by Terry Kennedy. So they're in business, first and second. Nobody out, tying run of the plate, and Rupert Jones is having a big series. And Jones makes a mistake here. It cost him an RBI. He had a weak ground ball out in front of the plate toward first base, first base side. And the catcher, Bellardello, came up with the ball, threw it to first base. The ball hit Jones. But he was out of the baseline. He was to the infield side of the bag, and that means he is out. And it was called correctly by the first base umpire, Lanny Harris. And therefore, nobody else can advance because that's the penalty on that play. The runner, Gwynn, had already scored from third. It would have been for Jones' his 50th RBI of the year and his eighth in this series. But it cost him. He is out. Uh, the play has scored 2-3. to three, Bill Ardello to Dreesen. And nobody can advance. Kennedy, in fact, is sent all the way back to first. He had gone to second. So that's a big faux pas by Roop Jones. It cost his team a run. And then on the very next pitch, Templeton hit into a 6-4-3 double play to get Shearer and the Reds out of the inning. So a big break there for Cincinnati as Jones is hit by the ball uh, as he is out of the baseline. The ball... Hit him in the back, I guess, and uh, if he's out of the uh, three-foot lane to the infield side, he is out, and that apparently is what happened. And then Templeton bounced into the double play, the only one turned by the Reds on the game. That is number 116 in the double play department this year for Cincinnati. And that is their first in this series, and only one in the series. So they get no runs, two hits. They had him at first and third, none out. No errors, one runner is left on base. So it's still a 5-2 Reds lead going to the bottom half of the eighth inning. The Reds get a base on balls from uh, the reliever Rasmussen to Paul Householder. He then steals a base, has his eighth steal of the year in 19 tries, and then he's caught stealing with Barnes at the plate. He steals and is caught all within a period of a couple of minutes. He's thrown out. He tried to get Rasmussen as he was just lifting his leg, but Rasmussen had not gone into his move yet. He stepped back off the rubber and just casually fired on to third baseman Salazar, and they nailed him easily, one to five. As Householder never broke stride and went in sliding, but he was thrown out. So one for two in the inning and steals for House. He has caught a whole bunch of times uh, this season. That's the 12th time he's been nailed. He's not 8 out of 20 in steal attempts. Then Barnes drew a base on balls on a 3-2 pitch, and that brings Bellardello to the plate. And he gets a fly ball to right field, and Foley ends the inning with a fly ball to left field. No runs, no hits, uh, no errors, one runner left on. Then in the ninth inning, Shear gets him down here, and there was a an error that was not costly. It was a base on balls in the inning, but he did not come around to score. Shearer nailed it down. He's been doing a great job. He's got a microscopic ERA of almost nothing over his last handful of games. Salazar on the first pitch and a fly ball to center fielder Milner. Then a base on balls to rookie Edwin Rodriguez. And he should have been forced out on a ball hit by first baseman uh, Joe Lansford, the brother of Oakland's Carney Lansford. Joe hit a ground ball to second. It was almost tailor-made because Lansford is a burly guy. He doesn't run a lick. And it probably would have been a 4-6-3 game-ending double play. But Oster hurried himself. And he threw the ball away, trying to get it to Foley to get uh, the runner, Rodriguez. He threw it by second base, and I think it was picked up by the third baseman, and probably picked up by the third baseman, Barnes. 
So that should have been a force play, but instead it's a fielder's choice and an error on Oster, the only error in this game. The fifth error in the series for Cincinnati, the 107th error committed by the Reds this season. That's still a very good total, I think first or second in the league uh, for the team with the lowest amount of errors. So first and second, one out, and the tying run is now at the plate, and the person of Bobby Brown, who swatted a couple of homers against us this year, he hits into a force play, a nice play by Barnes. They get Lansford 5-4. to four. Rodriguez goes to third. Then there's a pinch hitter for Rasmussen in the number two position. Righty swinging former red, Kurt Bavakwa, hitting 259 on the year with a couple of homers, 24 RBIs. He's had one homer and 16 RBIs as a pinch hitter, going 14 for 29 as a pinch hitter. That's just a shade under 500. He's now 14 for 30 as a pinch hitter with his game-ending fly ball the other way to the right fielder. Fairly deep. Householder made the catch. No problems. And this one belongs to the Reds. Any runs there would have been unearned after that force out by Brown because that should have been the third out, the fielder's choice hit by Brown. But they get actually the fourth out as Shearer does a good job. Ras, uh, uh, Rasmussen taken down for Bavakwa and Kurt, a uh, game-ending fly ball to right. The Reds win the series 2-1, to one, split the seasonal series 9-9. Nine and nine. If the Reds had lost this game, it would have been two straight years they would have lost the seasonal series to the Padres. And back to 1972, the Reds have lost only one seasonal series to San Diego, and that was 1982. But we split with them going 5-4 and four at Riverfront, 9-9 nine and nine overall. And Shear, a good job to get the save. No runs, no hits, an error, two left on in the ninth for the Padres. The Reds 5 and the Padres 2 is the final. And now moving to the final statistics pages for the visiting Padres. They used 12 players in the game. In this, their 155th contest of the year. They're now 1 under at 77 wins and 78 losses. That's a 497 winning percentage, and they are 11 games back in fourth place in the West. Number 20, Bobby Brown in left field, let off. He was 0 for 4, batting second. At first base, Al Wiggins, number 2, 0 for 3, scored 1, stole 2 bases. Also, hitting second, number 27, Denny Rasmussen, pitcher, nothing across. Number 7, Kurt Bavacqua, pinch hitter, 0 for 1. Batting third in right field is Tony Gwynn. Fine hitter, he was 2 for 4 today, a couple of singles. Uh, really, a couple of gift hits. It was an infield hit that he might have been out on if Paleo had not interfered, really, on that play. And then he had a bad hop single, but it looks the same in the box score. 2 hits, 4 at bats, no runs, no RBIs for number 19, Tony Gwynn. Batting fourth is the catcher, Terry Kennedy, the ex-Cardinal. He's number 16, one for three for him. No runs, one RBI. Batting fifth. In center field is Rupert Jones, number nine, one for three, no RBIs, one run. Heading sixth, going one for four with an RBI is number one, Gary Templeton, the shortstop. Batting seventh at third base is Luis Salazar, number four, zero for three. Hitting eighth at second base is Edwin Rodriguez, number 36, one for three. Batting ninth, the pitcher, Andy Hawkins, number four, zero, zero for one. In this game with a walk, and number 21, Joe Lansford, a pinch hitter first baseman, 0 for 2. 31 at bats for the Padres, 6 hits, 2 runs, 2 RBIs, no errors. For Cincinnati, just 10 players used. Number 20, Eddie Milner, center field, 1 for 4 with a run scored. His batting average stayed the same at 254. He's got 124 hits this year, slugging average 375. Batting second in left field, Gary Reedus, number 2, he was 0 for 4. That puts him down to 245, 109 hits for him, a slugging average, which is second on the team, a 438. Batting third at second base, Ronnie Oster, number 16, one hit, three at bats, and a runs, or no runs, one RBI, one error. Extended the hitting streak to 11 straight. He's now leading the team with 143 hits, 209 total bases, a 266 average. Slugging average is uh, 389 now. Hitting fourth at third base is Danny Dreesen, number 22. One for four, no RBIs, one run scored. His average is at 279, stays the same, 103 hits. Slugging average of 420. Batting fifth in right field is Paul Householder, number 21. He was officially 0 for 1 today with three walks, one intentional, one run scored. His average drops off one point to 254, 90 hits for him on the year. He's hit safely in four of six, 14 of 18, 19 of 26, and he's he's got hits in 26 out of his last 38 games, a slugging average of 384 now for the Reds outfielder. Batting sixth at third base is Skeeter Barnes, number 15. One hit, two at bats, a run scored, a run batted in. His first big league homer, and he's now four for 18 as a major leaguer at 222. Batting average with three RBIs. Batting seventh is the catcher, Dan Bellardello, number nine. A big day, two hits, a homer, a double, one run scored, four at bats, two fly balls, three runs batted in, and a star of the game and a game-winning RBI. And... Bill Ardello now batting 231 on the year. Slugging average rockets up to 370. That's an increase of 16 nudges. Batting in the eighth position at shortstop is Tom Foley, number 10. Zero for three for him with a walk. 18 for 89. He's batting 202 on the year. Batting ninth, pitchers Charlie Puleo and Billy Shear. The former was over three. The latter no time up. 
Paleo 5 for 48, a 104 average on the year. Sheer 091 average this season. This is game number 155 for the Reds. Their record is 72 and 83, 11 under 500 for a 465 winning percentage. They're now five games behind the fourth place Padres. They're 16 games back in dead last in the National League West, but have gained a couple of games over the last two days on the front running Los Angeles Dodgers. Some pitching lines now for the Padres. Right handed Andy Hawkins, number 40, is the loser. He's now three under 500. He goes to two and one lifetime. Make that two and two lifetime against the Reds, one and two this year, one and oh last year. Against the Reds this season in four starts, he had a complete game and a 381 earned run average, surrendering 18 hits, including three homers and 26 innings, 12 runs, 11 earned with 13 walks, 10 strikeouts, and he hit a couple of people. Had a complete game win his last time out against us on September 9th at San Diego, an 8-2 final. He allowed four hits and two runs, one earned in nine innings with two walks and four strikeouts. One of the runs came on a homer. On June 14th at San Diego, he was not involved in a 4-3 Reds win, giving up five hits and three runs in seven innings with four walks and a strikeout. And then he lost an 8-1 decision to Bruce Bereni and the Reds on June 9th at Riverfront, giving up five hits and three runs in four innings with two walks and a strikeout. And he hit a batter in that game as well as September 9. So 2-2 two and two for him lifetime against the Reds. In this game, six innings, four hits, two home runs, and two doubles given up. Four runs all earned. He walked five, and two of those were deliberate. He struck out four. On the year, he's been in 20 games, 18 as a starter. He has four complete games, one against the Reds. He has one shutout, no saves. 4-7 and seven with a 3.08 earned run average. That elevates from 291. So that record does not reflect his other good stats. 111 innings, 99 hits, 38 earned runs. He's walked 44 and has fanned 49. Then rookie left-hander Dennis Rasmussen, number 27, took over for the final two innings. He allowed two hits, no home runs, one run it was earned. He walked a couple and he struck out one batter. This was only his third game in the National League. He has no record, no starts, no saves, and a 135 earned run average. He had given up two unearned runs in his first ever appearance in two and two-thirds innings, and he went two innings of two-hit no-run ball with a couple of walks and a strikeout. Overall, in six and two-thirds innings this year, he's allowed six hits, three runs, one earned with six walks and six strikeouts. For Cincinnati's pitching lines, a couple of... No, a right-hander and a lefty, just like the Padres. Righty Charlie Puleo, number 25, is the winner. He's now 5 under 500. He gets his first win this season and his second lifetime over San Diego. Six and two-thirds innings in this game. He allowed four hits as all. Two runs both earned. He did not surrender any gopher balls. He walked five and he fanned two. Billy Shear, number 34, the lefty for the save. Two and one-third innings of two-hit shutout relief. One walk and no strikeouts. For Puleo, this is his 26th appearance. His 23rd is a starter. He's yet to get a complete game. He's had one major league complete game and one shutout. Coming with the Mets last year, he has no saves this year either. He's 6-11 and with a 490 ERA, down from 502. He has walked 88, has struck out 71, has given up 141 hits, including 17 long ones, and 137 and two-thirds innings. He has surrendered 83 runs, 75 of the earned variety. Lefty Billy Shear in 71 relief outings has 10 saves, two wins, three losses, and a very good 282 earned run average. He has not given up a run in a few weeks. 89 and a third inning, 69 hits, six of those hits have left the yard, 30 runs, 28 earned, he's walked 32, and has struck out 57. Some stats for Paleo against the Padres, lifetime his record is 2-5, and five. last year 1-2 and two with the Mets, this year 1-3 and three against them, closes out this year with four starts against them, no complete games, and a 540 ERA. He allowed 22 hits, 15 runs, 14 earned, one home run, Two hit batsmen, 22 hits and 23 in a third innings against the Pies with 15 walks and 10 strikeouts. Back on June 15th at San Diego, he lost a 5-1 decision, giving up five runs, four earned, five hits and five innings. A hit batsman, a home run, two walks and two Ks. In the first game of a doubleheader at San Diego, August 6th, he lost an 11-4 final, giving up seven hits, three runs all earned, no homers, three walks, four strikeouts and six and a third. Then on September 9th against Hawkins at San Diego, he lost that 8-2 decision. He allowed six hits, five runs all earned in that game and five and a third with five walks and two strikeouts. And a categorized summary of some of the stats, uh, the Reds winning at 5-2. to two. There were six doubles in the game, three for the Padres, Jones, Templeton, Rodriguez, respectively. For the Reds, Dreesen, Bellardello, Milner, no triples. Home runs, Barnes, his first, Bellardello, his eighth. Let's listen in again to those home runs in the second inning. That one hey, driven back into deep get left field. Get it might be Skeeter's out. first. Oh, it is. Skeeter Barnes gets his first major league home run. Bellardello has done that seven times in his rookie season as he steps in, hitting 227. He hits one back into deep left field, and that's going to be gone. Back-to-back -back home run on consecutive pitches. Skeeter Barnes and now Danny Bellardello and the rookie catcher. 
And those were the only two home runs in this contest. A game-winning RBI, sixth of the year for Danny Bellardello. Stolen bases, six of those, four for the Padres. Wiggins had two, Jones one, Gwynn one, and for the Reds, Milner and Householder. Cot stealing Householder. Sacrifice fly Kennedy, double plays one apiece. Winner Paleo, save Shear, loser Hawkins. The Reds had five runs, six hits with one error and left six. The Padres, two runs, six hits, no errors. They left nine, error by Oster. A two-hour, 32-minute affair, and they had 21,483 on hand at Riverfront. Total season's paid attendance, according to the box score reports, is now 1,158,053 for 75 dates, averaging over 15,400 per date here in the 83 season. That's a look at this contest. Reds winning it on the home run power and the good pitching of Paleo and Shear. 5-2 to two, the final. And the scoreboard is next. The Baltimore Orioles this afternoon clinched the American League Eastern Division title with a 5-1 to one win over the Milwaukee Brewers at Milwaukee. For Baltimore, it was its 96th win of the year. They now lead by 7.5 over Detroit, and it is now mathematically impossible for anybody to catch Baltimore in that division. Therefore, it will be the Orioles against the White Sox in the 1983 American League Championship Series next month. The White Sox clinched the AL West on September 17th. They lead in that division by 19.5 over the Kansas City Royals, 95 wins for Chicago. In the National League East, it's Philadelphia on top by four games over Pittsburgh. In the West, the Dodgers lead by 3.5 over Atlanta. Atlanta trimmed L.A.'s lead to 3.5 over the last couple of days as the Braves beat the Dodgers two straight and take two of three in that series, the final series of the year against the Dodgers, and you would have to categorize those as must-wins for Joe Torre's gang. An easy win... Today, a run of the first inning, a home run by Brett Butler, his fifth of the year, and they went from there to post a 7-1 victory in front of 43,931 at Atlanta. In other National League happenings, Montreal beat Pittsburgh 5-3. They had 37,602 at Montreal. And it was San Francisco shutting out Houston at the Dome in front of 6,130, 3-0 behind a five-hit complete game shutout of rookie Scott Geraltz. And in other games, it was the Phillies in 10 innings beating the Cardinals 6-5. Uh, to five. Philadelphia's 10th straight win. Pete Rose, a game winner in the 10th inning. Two homers for Lonnie Smith and Len Matusik hit one out. They had 20,079 at St. Louis. Earlier in that series, by the way, Philadelphia's Steve Carlton picked up his 300th major league win against the team, ironically, that traded him away to the Phillies some 11 years ago. And also, with that victory, it mathematically eliminated St. Louis, so it served two purposes. Congratulations to Steve Carlton for his 300th lifetime Major League win this weekend at St. Louis. And it was the Mets losing to the Cubs at Wrigley Field 11-7, a six-run second inning for Chicago. 6,421 saw that game at uh, Wrigley Field. Two homers for George Foster. That gives him 27 on the year, and Gary Rasich banged out his first of the season. In American League action, Toronto with three in the ninth beat the A's 8-6. to six. A couple of more home runs for the Two big guys in the Blue Jay attack. Willie Upshaw is 26th and Jesse Byerfield is 25th. Dan Meyer and Rance Mullenix also hit him out today. They had 14,650 at Oakland. It was Chicago with a win over California. White Sox continue to roll. Eight to five victors today. Home runs for Schofield, Pachoric, and Pettis today. 38,575 at California. It was New York over the Indians, 6-4. to four. Home run for Ron Hassey. 31,303 saw that game at New York, and it was Detroit over the Boston Red Sox 3-2, a home run for Kirk Gibson, 20,595 at Tiger Stadium. And the big win for Baltimore today, 5-1 final over Milwaukee in front of 45,181 at County Stadium, home runs for Jim Dwyer and Joe Nolan. And it was Seattle over Texas 2-1, 5,787 saw that game at Texas, and finally Minnesota over Kansas City. 7-1, to one, Tom Brunanski is 27th home run, 22,694 at Royal Stadium. That's a quick look at the Major League scores from this afternoon's action. Again, the final from Riverfront Stadium in front of 21,483 fans in a two-hour, 32-minute contest. The Reds win this series by conquering the Padres this afternoon, 5-2. to two. Until next time, so long.